Hello to everyone out there. This is our second question and answer session regarding unbiased stereology. My name is Dan Peruzzi. I'm a research liaison and head of tech support here at MBF Bioscience. Thank you very much for being here. In our last question and answer session, we went over uh, a review of unbiased stereology. We looked at all the different imaging modalities to get your uh, microscopic images into our program Stereo Investigator. And then we looked at estimating number. Today, we're going to look at estimating volume in thick sections, estimating length in thick sections. And at the end, we're going to consider doing unbiased stereology with thin sections. So during the category that I'm talking about, please send questions that pertain to that category. Just as a reminder, you can expand your panel with the orange uh, arrow and then find the question tool panel and type your questions in. This webinar is being recorded just like last, the last session was. And if you want to look at those recordings, there's the link right there. Okay, I want to reiterate from last session that we should always be using systematic random sampling, both on the intersection and the intersection level. What is a probe? It's the stereo, it's the um, virtual geometrical shapes that our program stereo investigator is going to generate. Our job is to mark the interactions between these probes, these virtual shapes, and whatever type of data that you're trying to estimate. We're going to try to stick with fractionator type probes, and they require that we keep track of the percent that is sampled, and then we do an uh, extrapolation to come up with an estimate. What can be estimated? We can estimate volume using points. We can estimate surface of membranes using virtual lines. We can estimate length of blood vessels or neuronal processes, length of biological strings using virtual planes. And to estimate number of cells, we have to be in a three-dimensional situation. This shows the, um, a dissector for the optical fractionator. So we can estimate number of particles in a 3D situation. So let's get right in, uh, uh, get started with your questions. Thanks for all these questions that you sent. The next most popular category is estimating volume. We're getting questions from all over the word, world. Eleonora from Italy asks, what's the best way of acquisition? Well, we talked about that in the last session. Uh, but how do we measure the volume of a Purkinje cell layer, say, in the cerebellum, or a granule cell layer in the cerebellum with BRDU? So the answer to that question is to estimate volume in an unbiased way, use point counting, cavillary point counting. Uh, we're going to see an example of point counting. Shirley states, alternatives to using stereo investigator for volumetric analysis of the striatum. Thank you for this. Will you have a webinar on neuroscience stereology estimating uh, volume? Okay, so different ways to estimate volume. If you're on the gross level, you could use uh, fluid displacement, but of course we're interested in the microscopic level. Today I am going to talk about point counting to estimate volume. Uh, another way to do it might be tracing. Tracing is considered, it is biased. Uh, and that just means that there's an unknown bias in an unknown direction when you trace, but that bias may be small enough uh, to make uh, tracing valid. What I'm going to talk about today, though, is point counting. Nirav from Germany, can we determine multiple parameters using the same counting frame? For example, use the upper right co corner for point counting and uh, use the counting frame for something else. Uh, is, is that a valid approach? When we get to our third category today, we're going to see an example of a probe like this where we mark points for volume and we mark intersections for surface. So yes, there are some probes that have you mark more than one thing, and we're going to see an example of that today. Chantel from South Africa says, I'm interested in using unbiased stereology to estimate area, volume, surface area of the lung, also blood vessel length. So in our last section, uh, we looked at how to estimate number. Today, we're going to look at how to estimate uh, volume and also length in thick sections. So the answer 
to um, how do we estimate volume in an unbiased way is to use point counting. Uh, by the way, with the lung, a lot of times you're restricted to, thick, uh, to thin sections, and that's why our third category today is going to be about thin section stereology. But if you are estimating volume, you can use thin sections. And so to estimate volume, what you want to do is um, cavillary point counting. On the left, it shows a section. Uh, epithelium is shown in red, and the goal here is to estimate the volume of the epithelium. Rather than um, tracing the serial sections, the um, systematically randomly chosen sections that we have, I'm showing an example of one of those. Rather than tracing those, we're going to use point counting. The uh, blue plus signs are the points, the vertexes of those uh, blue plus signs. And our job is to put these white X's down where we see a vertice of a, a blue plus sign over the red. Each one of these X's has an area associated with it, and we get an estimate of the area. So that is capillary point counting, and it's used to estimate the volume of contiguous regions. Here are some more questions. Uh, Monica from the U.S. says, hi, Dan. Hi, Monica. I have image stacks of lung obtained with tomography and x-ray. I need to evaluate shapes, volumes, and percentage of infection using these images. How can I do this with Stereo Investigator? Well, we just stated that to estimate volume, we can use point counting. Uh, Monica is um, introducing something different here, which is percentage of infection. So the answer to that is to use another point counting probe, which is called area fraction fractionator. That would give you an estimate of the percent by volume. Cornelia asks how to analyze the amount of colored points of a protein in relation to the volume of, um, of say, the placenta. And so we can use area fraction fractionator to get an estimate of the percent by volume. Notice we're having questions about placenta and about lung. A lot of you are in the neuroscience field. Uh, whatever the tissue or organ, as long as you can do the systematic random sampling and get the images into our program, Stereo Investigator, we can, um, we can estimate uh, volume in this case. So Alicia asked, uh, thank you for uh, last session. We use fluorescent samples to use area fractionator and we observe the image in white and black. Is it possible to add color to each marker? When I show uh, an example of area fraction fractionator in one minute, you're going to see that we do use uh, different colored markers. That's um, kind of integral to the probe. Okay, so the answer to estimate percent by volume is to use the area fraction fractionator. It is capillary point counting, but we use one type of marker for one phase of the tissue. That could be um, infection, say in the lung, or the example I'm gonna show is uh, plaque, uh, plaque load. Here's some more estimating volume questions. Alejandro from Chile, I would love to know how I can improve my sampling using area fraction fractionator. I think it's quite a tricky probe. It can be tricky to uh, know which marker to put on which phase. And when I show you the example of area fraction fractionator, I think you're, um, you're going to see that we've simplified this whole process. And it, it, um, we're going to take the trickiness out of this probe. Joyce from the United States, the issue that comes up the most in using area fraction fractionator is determining how close together or far apart do I put my points. So we're, uh, when I go through the area fraction fractionator, not only are we going to look at how we use different color markers, uh, I'm also going to talk about how I decide uh, my spacing of the points. Anise from the UK, are there ways of making uh, field area fraction analysis via image J more accurate? Uh, I'm not going to talk about image J today, but I am going to talk about using stereo investigator whole slide to estimate percent by volume. Before we do that, let's go to stereology.info. Stereology.info is a, a web page that MBF Bioscience maintains. Uh, I do a lot of writing of articles on stereology.info, and it's a great resource to learn about unbiased stereology. Let's start at our probe index. I went over this in the last session, so I'm going to review. 
On the left, we're showing estimating volume. This is the most permissive type of probe because we can use thin sections and we can section the region from any direction that we want. To estimate surface or length, say, of blood vessels or number of cells, we highly encourage that you get thick sections, that you section thick sections. This means about 30 microns thick. For volume, we can use thin sections. That's maybe five microns thick. Um, I hope you're thinking of the names of these probes. I'm just going to show them here. The probe for estimating volume is capillary point counting with thin sections. These X's are the points. Isotropic fakir is a triplet of lines that needs to be done in thick sections to estimate surface. We're going to see an example in our next category today of using space balls to estimate length in thick sections. And in our last section, uh, session, we saw a, an example of estimating number of cells in thick sections. If you can't get thick sections, then there are probes for thin sections, and we're going to talk about that at the end of today's webinar. Okay, so if you want to find out about the um, probes for estimating volume, and you know their names, we can come here. Here they are, area fraction, fractionator, capillary point counting. It might be more likely that you know what type of data you want, and you don't know the names of the probes. So I'm going to, what are you estimating? And this breaks it down for first order in region by number, length, surface, and volume. We're talking about volume right now. This brings up a, 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 a guideline which shows us that we can section the, um, we can make our sections from any orientation we want, horizontal, coronal, sagittal, anything in between. We can use thin sections. Here's a representation of capillary point counting for estimating volumes of contiguous regions. Here is area fraction fractionator for estimating percent by volume of different phases of the tissue. This is the formula for capillary. The volume estimate is equal to the sum of all the points that we mark times the area for each point times the thickness of the section times how many sections you're skipping, the section interval. This explains um, the formula for area fraction fractionator, which is even simpler. We take all the points that we mark on one phase, say um, infection in the lung or plaque in the cortex, and divide it by all the points that we mark on the whole tissue to get a percent by volume. We don't have capillary uh, references here, but what we have is more modern references of, of people have, who have done a good job with this point count. So you can always go to stereology.info to uh, get an idea of the theory. Uh, Behind the probe, let's look at a practical demonstration of the area fraction fractionator right now. So I am working from home right now, and I am not using a version of Stereo Investigator that's connected to a microscope and a stage. These are the three versions of Stereo Investigator that you can use that are not connected to hardware. Stereo Investigator Desktop. That's what I'm going to use to show an example of uh, space balls to estimate length. It has all of the thick section probes and all of the thin section probes, and you load up image stacks into it. Right now, I'm going to use Stereo Investigator Whole Slide. This is designed more for slides, uh, whole slides that have been made on slide scanners. We have good technology to store those. We have a program called BioLucida. We can store these big whole slides and serve them right into our program. Um, the other uh, incarnation of Stereo Investigator that can be used without hardware is Stereo Investigator Clear Tissue. I showed an example of estimating number of cells in a very big image stack that was made possible by light sheet microscopy and clear tissue technology. Right now, let's open Stereo Investigator Whole Slide. It has probes for thin sections. It does not have thick section probes. It's really designed to work uh, with a workflow for slide scanning. I am going to start the Serial Section Manager, which is right here. And the Serial Section Manager is used to set up 
the section uh, subfraction. So in this case, I am uh, going to look, I'm going to sample on six sections. And my interval is going to be every 12th section. So we're starting up Stereo Investigator whole slide. And I'm going to bring in uh, a whole slide, which has plaque. And our job is estimate percent by volume of the plaque. Okay, and the plaque shows up here. It's, it's the red. And that, you can imagine it would be very difficult to trace all of that plaque. Okay, so first we would set up the serial section manager. And that would let us set up our um, interval of every 12th section. And this, uh, the first section is uh, randomly picked. So we're going to pretend like this is our first section. And our job first is to trace the outline. We have something called the auto move area, which helps out a lot with this. So this is our first systematically randomly picked section. And you can see that this dotted line here, this auto moved area, is really making it efficient to trace our first systematically randomly picked section. We're going to estimate the percent by volume of the red phase of the plaque. I'm making this tracing kind of loose because it's very easy to see the tissue uh, versus the background. Okay, I can do a move and a go to and get to the middle of this. Uh, now what I'm going to do is go to the image and show it at its actual size. So this really is a very big uh, whole slide montage. Here's an example of what the plaque looks like. And you can, uh, again, you can see how hard it would be to try to trace all of this plaque. So instead, we're going to go to probes and first define a counting frame. And this is defined at 250 microns by 250 microns. That's where I'm going to mark points. I'm going to turn off the auto move area because that's not needed anymore. Let's go back to probe. And now I'm going to uh, define the systematic random sampling. I'm going to use a mean of 10 sections, uh, 10 sites per section. And this is an example of uh, systematic random sampling. These counting frames are evenly spaced, but I am not going to be able to control the throw when I come to each section. So I say OK. And now we're ready to go and look at these probes. They're arranged by number, length, surface, and volume. I'm going to go to volume and turn on area fraction fraction here. It's telling me you can use thin tissue for this. Okay, so I have one marker named plaque, and I've labeled another marker not plaque. And since the majority of this tissue is not plaque, I've checked this box which says at each site, mark points within the contour automatically. And I set that up to be the not plaque. So when we get to each counting frame, it's going to mark every point um, with the marker that represents not plaque. I have my grid spacing set at 30 microns. We can do a measure line to kind of set the um, distance among uh, um, the distance between these points. So I wouldn't want to set my points far apart like this. So I miss the plaque. I wouldn't want to put them too close together. I'm using a distance of about that far. And I'm going to use 30 microns rather than 38.5. So now we're ready to do this probe at every site. The points are going to be in a counting frame, 30 microns apart, and we're going to autofill with not plaque. So I say OK. It goes to the first systematic randomly picked site. I can go to image, or uh, sorry, trace, and do plus minus to really be able to look at these points and see if I see plaque under them. I can also go to image adjustment and ungroup the color channels and turn off anything that might be in my way, like the dappy and the green. And I can see here that there's no plaque. 
So I will go to the next site. So, so that means I'm going to leave all the green asterisks to um, signify no plaque. And now I'm going to go to the next scan site. And I can use my show hide. And there's no plaque there. So I go to the next scan site. So you see um, it, it can be very efficient. So now I see that one of these markers is designated as no plaque, but it really is plaque. So I make sure I'm on plaque. And I'm um, uh, using my mouse wheel to make the circle bigger, and then I just click there. So our job is to just go through here, and wherever I see plaque, change from no plaque to plaque. So I'll proceed through these counting frames, and the majority that I'm getting is no plaque. So it's going to be a small percentage of plaque. So here's some plaque. I mark that. You can see it's very efficient to mark this plaque. It, uh, when we know how to do this probe, it is not uh, tricky. But it's very efficient. Because right now in front of you, I've gone through one section estimating the percent by volume of plaque. OK, we have five more sections to do. And I've done them already, so what I'm going to do is bring up that data file, kind of like a cooking show. Okay, so I did six sections, an interval of 12, uh, spacing of 250 microns. And what we can do is go to probes and look at the probe run list. And here we can see the six sections, so we pick them all. They're 12 sections apart from each other. The first section was picked randomly. Here's the uh, interval of 12. And we see the results for plaque is 2.1% estimated volume of plaque and not plaque is 98.9 percent. We have a CE here and what the CE does is it looks uh, for the variance from section to section. Uh, in an extreme example, if you had the same number of points in every section, this CE would, would go very low. So let's compare the CEs between plaque. Uh, this was the one that was only 2 percent. The CE is 0.1 and for not plaque, the CE is 0.06. The CE was less for the, um, uh, for the phase with less variance. So you can do this experiment where you estimate percent by volume of uh, infection in the lung or in this example of percent by volume of plaque. Uh, you saw me do one section. You can see it's not going to take you long. Uh, to do all the sections for one animal, for one region. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so that was an example of using Stereo Investigator whole slide, which does thin section probes. With volume, you're fine with thin sections. Uh, we estimated percent by volume, and I'd like to have you send in your questions right now, please. Let's see, it looks like we have questions. Okay, Craig is asking, what is the difference between thin sections and thick sections? The difference is with a thick section, you can fit an isotropic probe into that section. So for space balls or isotropic flicker or optical fractionator, you want to get a thick section. And in practice, that means about 30 microns thick, and that's after shrinkage. If you have... Um, Thin sections, we're talking about something like five microns thick. And for thin sections, you're going to have to manipulate those sections um, in order uh, to assure isotropy. OK, here's a good question from Syed. Uh, your square, that's the counting frame, seems to be missing some areas of plaques. How is this good sampling if you're missing these regions of plaque? So let's take an extreme example where there's all plaque. 
if you put those counting frames down and count points, you're going to get 100% all plaque. Same example, if you have no plaque there, you'll get all markers for no plaque. Now let's say each counting frame that you fall on has half plaque. That means that you are estimating 50% plaque. Now if the plaque is very homogeneously distributed, that means you have to do less sampling to get a good snapshot of what's going on than if the plaque is heterogeneously distributed. Now, usually we have a pretty heterogeneous distribution, so we're not going to get exactly 50% in each counting frame. Sometimes we might get 90%, 10%, sometimes we might get 50-50, sometimes we might get 10-90, but if you do enough sampling, and that, um, you will be able to get an estimate of the percent by volume. So the bottom line for that is don't worry if your um, counting frames are not completely filled with plaque or if there's whatever phase you're trying to estimate or if that phase is outside the counting frame that's okay and that's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, Aditya is asking can we do lesion volumes in the area of fraction fraction error? Yes, uh, you definitely can and if you're estimating say uh, percent lesion area of fraction fraction error is definitely the probe to use. You're going to be able to do it in thin sections. Okay, thanks for all those questions. Let's move on to our next most popular uh, category, which is estimating uh, length. So Dumas from Turkey asks, I am also interested in how I can estimate the length of intestinal villi in the intestine. Do I have to use thick sections for that? So the answer is, no, you don't have to use thick sections, but we recommend it. Because if you use thick sections, then you can use a probe that will assure the isotropy of the interaction between the probe and the biological strings, and that is called space balls. In order to fit the space balls probe in the, in the section, it has to be thick enough for that. And we can go to stereology.info and get a definition of what do we mean by thick sections, which is something like 30 microns, thick enough to fit a dissector or a space ball or a triplet of lines in there. Um, what we mean by thin sections is probably in the single digit, something like three to nine, not thick enough to fit um, a probe which is isotropic in there. Okay, Evelyn from the Netherlands asks, what is the um, unit for length? So, Every density has to have a numerator and a denominator, and in this case, it's length per volume, and we're at the microscopic level. So we're talking about microns per micron cubed. You may often see that uh, simplified to per micron squared. It's hard to think about what's going on with this per micron squared, but if we know that's microns per micron cubed, that's length per volume. Yasmin from the Netherlands, I quantified axonal length using space balls probe, and I'm going to show an example of that in a minute. I used the total length produced by stereo investigator and divided by the region of interest uh, volume provided by planimetry. So Yasmin is talking about tracing versus point counting to get a volume. It is an unbiased measurement, but unbiased doesn't necessarily mean bad. It means that the uh, there'll be an unknown bias in an unknown direction when you trace. Uh, the answer is yes. If you do a good job tracing, you can certainly use that for your volume. Um, always, always report the length and the volume separately. Don't give it as a decimal so that if there's a change, people will know whether the length or the volume changed. Aaron from the U.S., I'm quantifying capillary tortuosity. Uh, that that is a way to look at how straight these lines are, these biological strings. There is not a probe for that that I know of, but you could trace the capillaries um, in our program Vessel Lucida to look at how straight they are. What I'm going to look at today is estimating length in thick sections. Let's go to stereology.info to look at a little theory. In other words, how do we find out about probes to estimate length? Well, we go to what are you estimating and to length. And this 
we have a movie here which shows that if you are in a thin section and that's represented by this blue plane, you can use that section as the probe and count the intersection, but there's a, a consideration which is if your blood vessels or axons are all perpendicular to the plane that you're sampling with, the probe is going to think there's a lot of length there. But if it turns out that the plane that you're sampling with in a thin section is parallel to these biological strings, we're not going to find any length there. And that is why if you're using a thin section, you have to take your chunk of tissue, embed it in a sphere of embedding material, and roll it so that there's three degrees of freedom. It can roll any direction it wants. And that assures the isotropy so you don't always end up with a parallel or a perpendicular situation. If you don't want to have to um, lose the orientation of your anatomy and your tissue, get thick sections and use space balls. Here is the formula for space balls. Length is twice. The number of intersections you count between the space ball and the blood vessels. This is the surface area of the sphere, and notice that is in the uh, denominator of the fraction. In other words, that given the same number of intersections with a bigger space ball, that means there's less length there. This explains how to use the image plane as the probe, and it does say that you need to use isotropic sections. And down here are all of the references. We certainly recommend that you read these papers uh, to learn about the probe on your own. Okay, so that is some theory behind estimating length. Um, let's see an example of um, focusing through a space ball, an isotropic sphere. Well, uh, I'm actually going to use a hemisphere and marking the intersections of biological strings. Okay, so for this, I'm going to uh, use, instead of Stereo Investigator whole slide, I'm going to use Stereo Investigator desktop because this is a thick section probe. And previously, we've used a system connected to a microscope and a stage and collected these um, image stacks, which have blood vessels in them. So first, I'm just going to load one of these image stacks so we can get an idea of what one of the image stacks looks like. Again, it was uh, taken from a system with hardware. This is Stereo Investigator Desktop. And so what we do is load in the systematically and randomly collected stacks. Right now, I'm just loading in one stack. I can page up and down through here. And we can see cross sections, orthogonal sections, longitudinal sections through blood vessels. Imagine how long it would take to trace each one of these. We're not going to trace them. We're going to use an unbiased stereology probe called space balls. Look over here at the uh, Z meter. And if I focus all the way down through the stack, these stacks are 30 microns tall. So now instead of loading just one stack, I'm going to load two sections worth of stacks that were collected with SRS Image Stack Acquire Workflow, which comes with stere uh, the standard Stereo Investigator. OK, so I'm going to open up a DAT file, which has these stacks associated with it. So two sections. And what we do is go to, we have the probes organized again by number, length, surface, and volume. We're going to go to length and turn on space balls workflow. It says there that we need thick sections. It says continue working with because we've already done the systematic random sampling. Here we're just bringing up the stacks. We saw that the um, sections are 30 microns thick. So I am going to this step. I'm going to use a hemisphere, and I'm going to make that 25 microns. So there'll be a guard zone on the top and the bottom. So we're going to focus through a hemisphere. We're going to see small circles and then larger circles. We'll get down to the count object step. And I'm going to start counting. 
it found where the stacks are because I had moved them to another folder. And it's loading up the image stack. And okay, so now instead of um, estimating doing the probe on live tissue, I'm doing it on these image stacks that have been collected um, from another system. And it's asking me, where is the top of this stack? So I'm going to focus down a little bit. And I think now it's coming in focus. That's the top. Now I'm going to focus down to the bottom of the stack. I'm using my control key to go 10 images at a time. Focus at the bottom of the stack. I say, OK. Now it brings me back up to the top. And my job is to focus through this hemisphere. So at the top of the hemisphere, I have a small circle. I look around at the blood vessels. Are any of them going through this half of a sphere? And they're not. So now I focus down another one micron. And now I can see that this blood vessel is poking into the hemisphere. So I grab the marker and I mark that. So we're marking every place where these biological strings go through the plane, which is the probe. It's a um, half of a sphere. So I'm going to keep focusing down. Of course, the more intersections I get, the more length there is. The bigger my probe, given the same number of intersections, the less length. Notice I'm not marking this twice because it can only go through once. Of course, if it turns around and goes through again, I mark it again. I am imagining the middle of this blood vessel. And right there, I think it pierces a sphere. So I mark that. Now I'm going to keep focusing down. I'm about halfway through this hemisphere. This histology is kind of light right here, but there is a blood vessel right there. I'm imagining the middle of it going through the sphere, the hemisphere. So I keep focusing down. So this probe is not as quick as um, estimating volume, but it's still a very efficient way to estimate length. I don't see any other blood vessels going through that sphere. So that's an example of how to um, use space balls to mark the intersections of your biological strings, in this case, blood vessels, with the probe. I have a completed one that I'm going to show. It's uh, easy to export it to Excel. So um, this is after we've gone through and done two sections worth of space balls. We've marked 77 intersections in a pilot study. As a rule of thumb, maybe 150 intersections would be good. It really depends on your tissue. We've only done two sections here. And here is our estimate. It's 3.7 million microns. And our CEs, which look at the variance of the intersections from section to section, are pretty low just with 77. So when we do more sections, uh, we're going to have enough precision to get a good estimate, uh, uh, a good precise estimate of the length in that region. OK, let's get back to the PowerPoint presentation. And we're doing well with time here. So let's stop for any questions that people might have about length. OK. Roxana asked, for space balls, how thick should the stacks be? So we know that it can't be as thin as, say, 5 microns. Even 10 microns is really too thin to fit a space ball into that section and um, be efficient about focusing up and down and seeing if there's intersections. So I would say get that stack to be about 30 microns thick. And don't forget, if you are bringing it through ascending alcohol, concentrations during histology, it's going to shrink. So we're talking about after shrinkage. Really, the section has to be thick enough on the slide to fit the virtual sphere in there so that you can have many focal planes as you focus up and down, marking intersections. 
that is a good question. Thank you. Okay, this is a great question, which I really should mention. Every time I talk about estimating length, it's from Hermina. If one student allows the sections to drive further compared to another student, resulting in the same experimental cohort of tissue having different thicknesses, does this affect the stereological method? For length, it definitely does. So for something like estimating number, if you have some differential shrinkage um, because you did two histological batches or something like that, um, the tissue is going to shrink, the cells are going to shrink, you're marking the tops of cells, that shrinkage is not going to affect you. Um, if you're doing the point counting, uh, we are putting points uh, down on top of cross sections. If those have shrunk down, all we're going to do is for the thickness in the formula, we're going to use the, the non-shrunken thickness, and that will be an a priori shrinkage correction for volume. But for length, you are estimating what is there. So that is definitely a confounding uh, problem. In other words, the amount of shrinkage that happens, now you put a plane or a space ball and you, and you count the intersections, well, those, those lengths, those blood vessels have really shrunk. And you are getting an estimate of the uh, artifact tissue. You can put a um, correction factor on it, but that is problematic too because you don't know if the shrinkage happened more in, in uh, what axis did the shrinkage happen more? It usually happens more in the z-axis. Now you're trying to figure out what percent of your uh, strings are going along the z-axis. So it definitely uh, is, a, uh, is a problem when estimating length. And have your eyes open about it. So thank you for that question. You're estimating what's there. You're estimating uh, what it's shrunk down to. OK. We have two more questions. And we've seen these questions before, but I'm putting them up again to highlight another part of them. Chantel from South Africa, I'm interested in using unbiased stereology to estimate cross-sectional area and volume. Well, we saw an example of that, and we know we can use thin sections for that. Surface area we haven't touched yet, possibly also blood uh, vessels. Chantel's working in lung. Monica also is also uh, a pulmonary expert. I have image stacks of lung obtained uh, with x-rays. I need to evaluate volumes. We saw how we, you can do that uh, with point counting. Percentage of infection, area fraction, fraction area. How can I use stereo investigators? So the reason I have these up is because they're both working in lung. And it's true that in lung, oftentimes you need to use thin sections. If you can get thick sections, get them, I believe. There are some techniques to get thick sections in lung, but a lot of people are working with, say, five micron thin sections in lung. So I want to go over, I won't give as um, intensive as an example, but I'm going to go over some of the considerations for thin sections. Let's go to stereology.info and go back to our um, probe index diagram. So these are the probes that we want to use if we can, thick section probes. But if you can't get thick sections, Stereo Investigator has thin section probes in it also. So for instance, uh, um, if you, we want to estimate surface using a thin section, there's a probe called MERTS. Uh, it has half circles, and we can look at the intersection of those half circles with the surface. If we want to estimate length, we can use the image plane as the probe. But here we're in thin tissue situation, and in that case, you have to take your chunk of tissue and randomize it in three directions. That's called isotropic sectioning, um, and it's just something you have to do if you are estimating surface or estimating length using thin sections. So let me bring you to a part of stereology.info that we haven't looked at yet. I've gone through some of the classical literature for different tissues and organs. 
and I have kind of compared the classical terminology for what they're looking for to what you can do in Stereo Investigator to get that data. You may see some of your favorite tissues or organs here, but what I want to talk about is pulmonary. So on the left side, it shows kind of the um, traditional way that lung researchers over the decades um, have looked at the research. In the middle, it shows the tissue that we're probing, and on the right, it shows how we would do this in Stereo Investigator. So let's start with volume. Remember that with um, thin sections are fine for volume. So I have some examples here of area fraction fractionator. You can use area fraction fractionator on your thin lung sections. Don't forget we're going to um, use a section interval. If you have 120 sections, you might use every 12th section to come up with 10 sections, a random start. You can use area fraction fractionator to get percent by volume of anything. For instance, uh, percent by volume of edema. Throughout the decades, lung researchers have talked about airspace fraction. When you read the papers, and you can go down here and look at these reviews, uh, what they're doing is point counting. So you can use area fraction fractionator, uh, one type of point on alveoli, another type of marker, a different color marker. We definitely use the different color markers um, over um, non-alveoli and you get airspace fraction. Destructive index is a huge thing in the lung and it's a huge thing right now with COVID-19. I believe this was Monica's question, um, getting percent by volume of infection in the lung. That's called destructive index. You can use area fraction fractionator to do that. So volume in thin section is very easy uh, um, because the volume probes use thin sections. What about estimating number? Well, we can't use an optical fractionator because we don't have thick sections. So we have to use something called a physical fractionator. We could estimate, say, the number of type 2 cells in the lung by using two thin sections rather than one thick section, looking for the leading edge of the cells. There's a special problem in lung because it's filled with these air sacs. And we said that to count numbers of particles we need to find the leading edge of the particle. But picture a balloon and picture trying to find the leading edge of it with its thin wall. It's next to impossible to do. So instead, lung researchers talk about the connectivity probe, which is a really elegant way to look at unbiased stereology. So here's our connectivity page in um, stereology.info. Connectivity looks at unbiased stereology through islands, which island is simply the leading edge of the particle and bridges. We're going to see what bridges are and the occasional hole. You can do all kinds of things with connectivity, like look at bone, uh, trabecular bone. But what we're going to do is use it for estimating the number of alveoli in the lung. It's hard or impossible to spot the leading edge of the air sac, so mostly bridges are counted. This really boils down to the physical fractionator probe. So here I have a picture of two thin lung sections superimposed on each other. Here is a whole intact alveoli. We can see it's four walls. Here is uh, about four microns later in the next thin section. We have broken into the wall of the alveoli. That's why it's called a bridge, because if you wanted to traverse that cross section of the of the thin wall, you need a bridge to get over it. There's, so instead of marking the top of the air sac, which we can't really see, we mark where the first bridge appears. And that's why lung researchers talk about and use the connectivity, which is really the physical fractionator probe looking for bridges in order to estimate number. Okay, now a big thing in the lung is the respiratory membrane, a big thing that people want to know about. There is a probe for thickness. It's called orthogonal intercepts. You're supposed to use isotropic sections with it. We use counting frames, but riding in the counting frame is a black grid, and this grid gives you an unbiased place to make a measurement. In this case, it's the um, uh, membrane in the placenta, 
that we're getting an estimate of the thickness, so the mean of these measurements are taken in different ways. So keep in mind there is a probe for thickness, and you could use that in the lung. What about surface? We haven't talked about surface in any of our um, question and answer sessions yet. If you're going to use thick sections, which if you can get thick sections to it, you can use a probe called the isotropic plaquer. But if you are kind of stuck with thin sections, which you might be in lung, I'm going to show a probe called the, let's see, we want to get surface. Uh, there's two probes you can do that with, Mertz or Weibel. Mertz uses half circles. Traditionally in lung research, um, lung researchers have used this Weibel probe, which is a dash and point system. So I want to finish up the webinar by just showing an example of this multi, uh, uh, multi, a multi-test probe. Okay, let's pause the slideshow, and I'm going to use Stereo Investigator Desktop for this. I've already traced the lung for this. So I'm going to load up that tracing with the image of the lung associated with it. Again, this would be um, the serial section manager would be being used, which I'm not showing just for time. So we're pretending like this is the first of a series of systematically randomly selected sections. Let's zoom in. We can do a zoom in to just look at the cross section through the lung and my tracing of it. This is a large whole slide image montage. So let's go to actual size and we can see the cross sections through the alveoli here. I'm going to use the Weibel probe, which is used on thin sections, and I'm going to estimate, uh, I'm going to show how we would estimate the surface of the walls of the air sacs of the alveoli. So let's go to probes, and we want to do surface. At the very top, because we encourage you to get thick sections, is isotropic fakir. I don't know if you can see, there's a little icon of a triplet of lines that are mutually orthogonal to each other. But we need thick sections for that, and we have thin sections here. We could use the Mertz probe, which is half circles. But I'm going to use the Weibel probe, this dash point test system. I'm going to set that to be 175 microns. That's going to be the length of these lines. Uh, they're in green right here. They're kind of thin. But what we have is a green line with two points on the end of it. And if we want to estimate surface of alveo alveoli lung per volume of the, of the lung, that means every place we see a point we need to, that is on the lung, we need to mark it. And these points are, are showing up in yellow. I can use my control key to mark many points because there's going to be a lot of points inside the volume. Now let me zoom in a little bit. I'm going to pick a marker for the intersections for surface. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see what's going on here. So this is a multi-purpose test system. We're marking points for volume, and then every place I see this line, which is the probe for surface, go through the alveolar wall, I mark it. Or you could be doing the respiratory membrane, finding the surface of that, if I was marking every place where I saw the respiratory membrane. So this is a, a classic probe for lung stereology. It can be used to get uh, surface per volume of whatever you want to get the surface area of, respiratory membrane, walls of the alveoli. If you mark these marks inside, if you put your points only inside of alveoli and these marks only on alveolar walls, you can also get the cord length of the alveoli, which is a big thing that lung researchers also want.
Okay, so that is kind of the considerations that you have to take into account when dealing with thin sections. And the biggest um, consideration is for surface and for length, and that is that you have to assure isotropy by manipulating your tissue in a funny way. That's why if you can get thick sections, get them. But if you have thin sections, we have all the probes uh, that can handle thin section stereology. If you're doing percent of damage in the lung, you're all set. You can section the tissue any orientation you want, and you can use thin sections. Okay, let's see if we have any questions about uh, about using thin sections. Okay, I'm not getting many. I'm not getting any questions about thin sections. Please send in any question that you have now or whenever you want to because we really want to collect these questions uh, for possible future webinars. I'd also like to remind people that we have a, uh, a forum open and in that forum we can discuss um, unbiased stereology and neuron tracing. So thank you very much for your time today.